Today, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pumped, not because football season starts uh, this weekend, um, um, not because the Patriots got slaughtered on Thursday. Um, I'm sorry if you're a Patriots fan. Um, I, uh, I am excited. I am excited um, because of, of where we're headed the next few weeks and, and what the Lord has laid on my heart. So as, as Doug was talking about prayer, um, there was a uh, uh, as I as I just really dug into uh, spending time in prayer the last few weeks, and and, and as it as it began, I'll, I'll share some of this story with you as we go through. Uh, but I had a challenge from a friend to really wrestle um, um, uh, with with God about some things concerning my life. And as I began to do that, and I'll and I'll share that whole story with you, and um, um, uh, as as we move forward in the in the weeks to come, but. But God, I, I'm telling you, God showed me some things. God revealed some things to me um, about who he is and about who I am. Things that I might have known here, but I didn't believe here. I mean, no, it's, it's, a, different, it's a different thing to, to know something here than it is to believe. that We, we act out of what we believe, not what, by what we know. Um, and, and so there are things we read about in Scripture. There, there are truths that we read about in Scripture, and we might have them up here. But if the Bible talks about even salvation, is salvation is not a head thing. It's not I heard a prayer and I repeat a prayer. The Bible says I have to believe it in my heart. I have to believe that in my heart. Salvation comes because of a heart belief, not because of something I heard and is in my head. I've got to get the Word of God from here, from here to here. And so... So the Lord began to, deve- to, to, to show me uh, as I spent time with him, um, and, I, and I, would just, I would get to the Our Father part of the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, and I would just say, Father, I, I, I'm just sitting in this chair, and I, and I, and I thank you that, that I can talk to you like you're sitting in that chair, and that, that you're a good father, and you're, you're like, you're a daddy to me, and so, Father, I just... What is it that you want to show me today? And the Lord began to reveal some things to me, and I have been about to explode for several weeks. And, um, and so over the next few weeks, I'm going to share some of those things that God has shown me personally and, and how it's begun to shift the way I think the way I believe and how I do life and how I approach him as father. It is, um, it, it is I cannot tell, I, th- there have been God moments in my life of divine encounters, but I can tell you this, I can't think of any recently that compared to this, this last few weeks. It's been incredible. And I'll say this, that it's been one of the most challenging um, as, I've, uh, 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 as I've done it. There, uh, there have been some major challenges as I've, as I've walked through this. How many think that the enemy um, um, tries to put up hurdles in our way? And so we've, I've walked through some of those things, and, um, and there's times when I'm like, what is going on? I've gotta, I'm spending time with you. I, what, how, why is this happening? And, um, and the Lord has shown me that the enemy, the enemy wants to stop you from knowing who God is and who we are as sons and daughters. And so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about God being our father and us being sons and daughters and what that looks like. In the weeks to come, I'm just going to throw out some teasers. Uh, The Lord showed me something about living in a place where we reap where we have not sown. And I didn't even know that was scriptural. I know that the Bible says that God is a man. Uh, there's a parable where it says that God is a, 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 a man in this parable um, who reaps where he has not sown. Let me just say this. That's a whole lot different than sowing and reaping. Although the law of sowing and reaping works, there is a different place that we can get in and God wants us to get into where we reap where we have not sown. And some of you might be like, oh, I don't know about that. Listen, God, uh, Adam did not plant the Garden of Eden. It plainly says that God planted the Garden of Eden and he put man in it to take care of it. So, where, where, so the fruit that was available to him, Adam did not plant those trees. God planted the garden. God did it. The, um, and so, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about inheritance, what, in, what inheritance looks like for you and I. What does is, what is our inheritance look like? I'll just throw this out there. Inheritance is not earned. If it, is, if it is earned, then it is a wage. Inheritance is favor that's given to you out of relationship. It's, it's, it's simply given to you because you're in relationship. 
And so, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the fact that God says in, in Scripture, God says, all that I have is yours. And what does that look like for us? If all that God has is ours, then, then some of us aren't walking in what God wants us to walk in. That's coming. We're not going to talk about that today. <laughs> Let's get into this today. Galatians 3, Romans 8. Galatians 3, Romans 8, Hebrews 12. Just those three places. Galatians 3, Romans 8, Hebrews 12. Father, just speak to our hearts today. Show us, reveal to us things today that perhaps we've never seen before. Father, I pray that that the blinders are taken off in areas where the enemy has tried to deceive us and keep us blinded. Jesus, you were sent to give sight to the blind. So I I pray right now, today, that things, that blinders are removed and that we see the truth for where we have believed uh, lies in the past. In Jesus' name, amen. If I was the enemy, if I was Satan, if, 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 if I was him, I mean, think about this. Where, what do you think, what do, where would be an area that you would attack if, if, God, if God is your father and you're to be his son or his daughter, you're to be a child of God, if that is true and out of that relationship, that's where you're supposed to live, how many think that the enemy would stop at nothing to lie to you concerning that relationship? How many think that the enemy would want to convince you that God is not who he says he is or, or what, he, um, what he claims to be? How many think that the enemy wants to give you a perverted view of who God is as father and he wants to give you a perverted view of who you are as a son and a daughter? He, his only power is deception. He is the father of lies, all lies. All lies come out of him. That's how he, that's how he operates. That how, is how he gets power over us, is by getting us to believe lies about who God is and who God says we are. And so the enemy, think about this. I was just, I was just, I was just, cons, I was just considering these facts. And so I, I wanted to know, because uh, I knew that there had to be an astronomical number. And so I, th- I thought, uh, World War II, I don't think it's a coincidence that in World War II, as a result of, of the aftermath of World War II, in Europe and, and, and in America, there were over 20 million kids raised without a biological father. Over 20 million in a generation. And that's not, that's not considering those that uh, in Asia. That's just Europe and America after World War II. 20 million kids growing up in a fatherless home. That's, that's a tragedy. How many think that that will affect a generation? How many think that that will affect how people perceive who God the Father is? Yeah. Let me just say this. Adam was created in the image of God. So as a father, or as a mother, but as a a father, what what we are to do is to show our kids the image of, of, of God the Father. And so if that's true, there are people who are carrying around father wounds that affect how they see God the Father. The enemy understands that man was created in the image of God. And so he attacks the, he attacks the very thing that's going to pass on to the next generation, a mirror image or a reflection of who God is. And so, so he, attacks, he attacks the Father. Because attacking the Father will, will affect the children. 20 million children in a generation growing up without their biological father. That's that's an enormous. Over 24 million children in the United States today. Today. There's no war happening, right? I mean, it's it's not because there's a war happening. Over 24 million children today and the United States are living in a home or in a place without their biological dad. More than after World War II. Not just more after World War II. That's in the United States alone. 
That's more than World War II in Europe and in the United States. Do you think that's a coincidence? I don't think that's a coincidence. I think there is a strategy of the enemy to pervert how we perceive God the Father. And he'll stop at nothing to mess that up. Now, now, now add to that all the absentee fathers that are there but really aren't there. Add to that all the emotionally detached fathers in homes. Add to that all the fathers who are disciplinarians but are not relational. Add to that all the abusive, all the abusive fathers. And can you see how people can grow up, how a generation can grow up and not understand who God is? And cannot understand what it looks like to be a son or a daughter. It's the, that's, the, that's the enemy strategy. It's because if he can get you to misunderstand who God the Father is or who you are as a son or a daughter, then he will, he will have made your life, he will have made your life much lower than the way you were designed to live it. We, we, God longs for us to tap into a way of living that so many of us fail to tap into. There is a belief system that starts at a very young age, and we take in inputs and we interpret things. And if those things, if, if, if that fathering, if that fathering is either absent, if that father is either absent, or if that's a negative experience, I, I think it was very interesting, Doug, that you said what you said back there. Uh, when I talked about the shirt I was wearing, because I believe that was right on. Doug had mentioned, I said, somebody, somebody had said to me that, that I was wearing a, a sleeveless, I was wearing a sleeveless shirt, and their uh, response was, it was a very little person, a uh, little child said, ooh, you're wearing a tank top. And Doug said, you know what, I, I believe that that's because there's an experience with that that's not good for her. In other words, that represents a negative experience in her life. And I go, I think you might be right. And so we walk through life, and if we have, if we have a, a picture that was painted of us, of what God looks like, then we begin to approach God the Father in, in that way, and, um, and we don't even know it. There are things that I believed that, about God that God showed me over the last few weeks that was untrue, but I believed it, and I didn't even know I, didn't even know I believed it. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna jump into this. Galatians chapter 3. If, if that's Satan's design, let's look at what God's design is. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. <clears throat> For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You are sons of You are sons, you are not slaves, you are sons, you're not servants, you are sons and daughters. That's who you are, uh, uh, um, that's who God declares you to be. A lot of times we approach God still as like Old Testament saints and, 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 and we've been made sons and daughters. There is some, there is a, there is, there is something that that carries that, that being a servant uh, does not carry. You understand that when we are sons and daughters and we realize, uh, think about this, you are a child of the king. You are royalty. That's who you are. You are a son. If, you're, if you've received his invitation to be a son or a daughter, you are a son or a daughter of the creator of the universe. That means there's a relational connection that you have. He is not, yes, he is God, but he is not just God to you. He is a relational father. He's a good father. I'm amazed at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because as as the Lord is going to Sodom and Gomorrah to deal with that city... The Lord says to the angels that are with him, How, I, I can't do this and hide it from Abraham. 
Why can't you, why can't you do something and not tell Abraham? Because they were buddies. There was a relational connection. I'm not going to destroy a city without talking to one of my buddies. I'm, I got a relational connection with him. I'm not going to hide what I'm doing. I'm going to go tell him exactly what I'm going to do. And then Abraham begins to intercede for that city. That's a powerful, that's a powerful story. God longs for relationship with us. What he lost in the garden was relationship. When you look at the whole story of redemption, it's about God redeeming man back into relationship with him. Think about this. Those of you that are fathers, what would you do? What would you do if your child was no longer in relationship with you? If they had messed up and they were, they were estranged from you, what would you do to get that relationship restored? And if, and if you, as a human being, would do whatever it takes, how much more would God do for you? That's what God did for us. When we realize that Jesus, that Jesus doesn't just ignore our sin, he became our sin. He doesn't snap his finger and and it's washed away. The song is the blood of Jesus, right? Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes. The blood of Jesus washes me white as snow. When we realize that the death of Jesus is what washes it away. It's not, it's not, okay, I'm going to forget about it. No, he doesn't forget about it. He paid for it. That's how powerful the story of redemption is. Man was in trouble. He can't fix himself, so God's got to fix it for him. Why? Because, because he, wants, he, just, he, he, he just wants to do it? No, he wants relationship with us. Just like me sitting in that chair and saying, God, I thank you that I can approach you as a father, like you're sitting in that chair right next to me. I know it seems odd, and we think, oh, you know, we're talking. We're talking. Listen, God is, God is more real than the things you can see. The things, you can, the things you can see were created by the things you can't see. The eternal's more real. So this God that we cannot see, he is here with us. He's, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. The Holy Spirit is here with us. He's moving among us. We often say, you know, we, we invite you into this place. That's just us being, that's just us being cordial. He's here. That's just us saying, you know, you're in the place and we just want to make sure you feel welcome, but you're here with us because we know you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Romans chapter 8. No, no, no. Go to, go to Galatians 4. Galatians 4. So this just continues with uh, the end of Galatians 3 there, and this is what it says. Now I, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave. Though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, everybody say, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But, everybody say, but. Okay, this, something shifted here. There's something shifts in this passage of Scripture. There was a time when you were slaves and in bondage. There was a time when that was the case. But look what happens. When the fullness of time had come. Remember when, when, when um, I love that terminology because that's exactly what it says when Mary was about to give birth, when the fullness of time had come. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, and listen, this is not gender specific, sons and daughters, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy God, that's a term of endearment. Therefore, you are no longer a slave. You were once a slave. You are no longer a slave. You are now a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You're an heir of God through Christ. How many has ever been an heir? You've, you've inherited something. One time I, I met a lady. One time. One time. I didn't do anything. I didn't, I didn't clean her house. I didn't mow her lawn. I didn't do anything. I met a lady, I was on a vacation with an aunt, and, um, 
And I met a, an old lady. And after meeting her, I, I, didn't even, I didn't even talk very much. I even went outside. She was in her apartment. I went outside. I don't even know if she saw me for like 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. I don't know. And I get home and I find out she's rewritten her will and put me in it. It was only, it was only $500. But here's the point. Here's the point I want to make is, is I didn't earn it. I didn't do anything to get it. I, I, was, I, was just, I was just myself. And it was out of relationship. It was out of a very small relationship of relational connection that I was, and I became one of her heirs. We're an heir, not because of what you do. I'm going to say that again. I'm, you're an heir, not because of what you do. It's because of what Jesus has done. He's the one, he's the one that has, has, has a good heart. He's the one that is good. And it's because of his goodness that you get, you get benefits from that. We'll talk about inheritance another time. Romans chapter 4, or chapter 8. Just reading passages of scriptures that, that, that talk about us being sons and daughters. I want you to, in that passage of scripture, it talks about the spirit of adoption. Everybody say spirit of adoption. <laughs> There's a difference between being adopted and knowing in your heart, knowing, knowing in your heart that you're a son or a daughter. There's a difference. There's a difference in somebody picking you and you, you like, like in other words, you could go and adopt a child and they will still live like an orphan the rest of their life if something doesn't happen in here to where they know that they know that they know that they are a son or a daughter. So, let me give you an example. The children of Israel were freed from Egyptian bondage, but the first generation never got free from Egypt in here. They were free. They were free out here, right? No chains on them anymore, but there were still chains here. So if something doesn't change here, if, if it doesn't change here... And, and here's, the, here's the struggle, is a lot of people walk through life, even though they've been adopted by God the Father, even though they've, they've been adopted into his family, they still live as orphans. Because deep down inside, they, they don't believe, they don't, they don't truly believe that they've been adopted by God the Father. Let me give you an example. So when, when, when somebody gets saved and and they think that they have to get saved next week because they did something they did something throughout the week that made God kick them out of the family that is an orphan that's not a, that's not a, that's not a son mentality L listen i did a lot of things wrong growing up and my dad never kicked me out of the family never never disowned me never divorced me God, my father even though i didn't act like a son sometimes i still remained a son those that walk around and they get they get they, they they listen to the they listen to the voice of guilt and shame, and that's what rules and drives them. They don't understand what adoption into the family of God looks like. I'm not saved because of my works. I'm saved because of grace. I stay saved because of grace. Now, I didn't say that I don't have to change, but it's God that does the change in me. It's Him working through me or I'll get the glory. If, 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 if I'm a self-made man, then I'm the one that gets the glory. And God shares His glory with no man. And so it's Him working in me so that I realize anything that good that comes out of me is Him. And I'm not saved and, I'm not, and I don't remain saved because of my goodness. I remain saved because of the grace and the mercy of God. I understand that I am a son. I'm a son because I've been adopted into the family. Now look, God didn't just adopt us. He did something else. He went a little bit further. And, and we just read it in Galatians, but let's read it because it says it again in, in, um, in Romans 8. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness, the Spirit in us, that we've been given. That Spirit, the Holy Spirit, not only did he adopt us, he put his Spirit in us that bears witness. That term bears witness means it witnesses to the truth. 
There's something inside of me that knows that I know that I know that I know that I know that I've been adopted into the family of God. That's how I can go to sleep at night knowing that, uh, pray the Lord my soul, to, right? If I should die before, pray the Lord my soul. To, why? Because of the grace of God. But I don't, I don't have to pray that prayer, by the way. Because I can go to bed and understand that I'm good. And I can wake up in the next, the next morning and know that I'm good. That I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the Father. Grace has been extended to me. It doesn't mean that when I sin, I don't deal with it. I, I, there's still consequences to sin. But the thing is that when I, when I sin, I go to the Father, I ask forgiveness, and the Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive me of all sin. The Bible says that he takes my sin and casts it as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't keep record of it. The enemy does. The enemy is the accuser, and he's the one that keeps the record, and he's the one that keeps bringing it up. So if there's a constant barrage of all your past sin, I can assure you that if you've dealt with it, it is not God the Father. That you're, that's not the voice you're listening to. There's another voice. It's the voice of the accuser, and you've got to shut him up. It's not tr- the, the, the voice of the accuser is not true. If God the Father forgot about it, we got to get to a place where we can move past it. Amen? The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. The Spirit of adoption in us rips off the blinders so that we can see the truth that we are sons and daughters. And the enemy doesn't want us to know that. He does not want us to know it. The enemy wants us to be blinded. Even though, even if we receive, this, even if we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and we've, we've, uh, we've accepted God's invitation into the family of God, the enemy wants to blind you to the truth that you are truly a son of God or a, child, or, or a daughter of God. He wants to keep you blinded in that area. The spirit of adoption was sent to rip off the blinders so that we can see. He's the, called the spirit of truth, the spirit of adoption. He's called also the spirit of truth so that he can give us the truth. Listen, there is, there is, a, there is a spirit of this world. There's the Holy Spirit, and then there's a spirit that operates in this world, a spirit of deception, a spirit that wants to keep you in bondage. It's a spirit, uh, the spirit of bondage that uh, we just read in that scripture that leads us to fear. The enemy, the enemy does not discontinue his onslaught on you when you become a, when you become a believer. Yeah. He doesn't stop. You constantly have to learn how to cast down imaginations. And every voice, every thought that comes against the knowledge of God, you have to learn how to cast that down because there is a voice of the enemy and he continually, uh, he continually attacks us with lies and tries to get us to believe those lies. There are people that I talk to, people that have been a believer for years and years and years, and they still struggle with, with, um, with not knowing uh, whether or not they died right now if they'd go to heaven. They, they still struggle with that. How, how can you struggle with that? Listening to the voice of the enemy. There's a different spirit that's speaking. So it's important for us to tune into the spirit of God. What's he saying? You're my son. You're my daughter. Yeah, but I, man, I really miss that. You're still my son. You're my daughter. Yeah, but you, you don't know what I did. You're, yeah, I do know what you did. You're still my son. You're my daughter. Well, you don't know. Well, I mean, I really said something. I shouldn't have said. You're still my son and my daughter. Well, I really thought something about somebody. I didn't say it, but I really thought it was in my heart. You're still my son and my daughter. Well, yeah, but I've really messed up. I've, and I continually mess up. I continue to do this over and over and over and over and over and over. You're still my son and my daughter. But there's a voice of an accuser that says, see, you blew it again. You messed up. God's mad at you. Dude, he's going to nail you. He's going to get you. You better watch out. You better watch out. He's going to get you. He's going to get you. God is so ticked off at you right now. He is so messed up with you. Oh, look, 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 look. Calamity hit you. Your car broke down. See, that's God mad at you. I heard a story yesterday about somebody who just bought a house. 
No, no they had two houses. They had, a, they, they had just bought a house. They had another house. Both of them flooded. Both of them flooded and their car flooded. They just bought a new car and their car flooded. That person could really interpret that as God being really, t- really ticked off at them. You know what I'm saying? And so a lot of times we, we interpret those events, but, but the truth is, but the truth is, the truth is that God loves you. He always loves you. He never stops loving you. It doesn't mean that he doesn't correct you, but I, I, we got to be very careful about how we think God corrects us. And that, that's, uh, we're going to do that in, uh, in a couple of weeks as well. How God corrects. The Bible does talk about God correcting his children. I mean, he corrects them. Some of us grew up in houses where we weren't corrected. We were punished. Uh, there's a difference. There's a difference between being corrected and being punished. Jesus was punished. Jesus was punished for you. I'm going to say that again because somebody, somebody about to get set free. Jesus was punished for you. It's like the wrath of God against your sin was poured, on, poured out on the one who became your sin. Why? Because God's good. It, it's like us walking into these houses. Some of these houses are nasty. They're nasty. They're dirty. They stink. Some of them stink worse than others. They stink. And here, here's the point. Is we can stay away and say, I hope, I hope somebody comes and helps you. Or we can, get in and get, we can get in and get dirty. God didn't say, you're messed up. I sure hope somebody comes and helps you. No, he got dirty. He got filthy. He took on not only our sin, he took on our shame. He took it all on us. He took our punishment. He became our whipping boy. He did. That, 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 was, that, was, that was yours. He took that for you. Why? Because he's a good father. And he wants relationship with you, and he couldn't have relationship with you apart from doing that. He had to do that in order to have relationship with you. So God longs, God longs for us to understand him. Romans 8, 29 says this, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be uh, the firstborn among many brethren. Everybody say brethren. That's a nice way to say brothers. Jesus, siblings, Jesus, so that Jesus could be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. He did that. God said, I predestined you to be my child. There's some that believe that there's only certain people that were predestined. God looked over all of creation. He said, I I love all of them so much, I'm going to give my son for the world. And there's some people that define the world as a a portion of the world. It doesn't say that. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God predestined you to be his son or his daughter. You know, I don't know what my purpose is in life. Well, I can tell you one thing is to be a, to be a son or daughter of the father. That's, that's what you were created to be. That's who you were created for, to be in relationship with God. And God said, God said, I, I've designed you for this, I've created you for this, and I did whatever it took to make this happen. The rest is on you. You just have to receive my invitation. Do you, do you want to be my child? And you can be my child. There's a place I set at the table for you, and anytime you want to walk up to the table and eat, of my, eat, of my, uh, eat at my table, it's available to you. God longs for us to understand what it looks like to be a child. Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to wrap it up with this. Just a quick picture of what it looks like. I want to encourage you today. I think in the, in the midst of all that's going on, sometimes we can lose sight of this. And, and um, I think it's important for us to, to see this and, and to be reminded of this. In Hebrews chapter 12, it just comes off of talking about all of the people in in Hebrews 11. And this chapter 12 continues that thought. Hebrews 11 is what we call the the, the hall of faith. 
It's, it's, it's God's hall of fame, so to speak. It's about all these saints who have done all these awesome things. And it talks about, talks about Abraham and, 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 and Moses. It talks about all these people that have done all these exploits for God. And then it gets to Hebrews chapter 12, and this is what it says. Therefore, talking about these saints, okay? Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Who's he talking to? He's talking about all these saints, since we are surrounded by all these of the, who have done awesome things, all those that have come before us, we're surrounded by them. This great cloud of witnesses, people who have seen God work in their lives, the three Hebrew children who saw Jesus show up in the fire. We're surrounded by people like that. Moses, who saw the Red Sea open. Abraham, who was willing to sacrifice his son, and, it's, and, and God showed up at the last moment. We're talking, those people, those people who have seen great and mighty things happen, they're, they're, I see I picture this as, as these guys looking at us in the mezzanine section, cheering us on. That's how I picture this. And the reason why I picture it is because the writer here paints the picture of a sports event. Listen to what he says. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Paints a picture of running a race with these cloud of witnesses around us. And, I, and so I picture this cloud of witnesses. I picture, I picture Abraham he's cheering you on. I know you're struggling in your faith, but I'm telling you, God is faithful. God's faithful. God's faithful. Come on, you can do this. I see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I know you're going through the fire. You're not alone. You're not alone. God is with you. He's in the fire with you. Don't, 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 don't lose sight of the fact that he's not going to leave you and let you go through this alone. I'm telling you, I'm a witness of the truth that God shows up in the middle of the fire. And so I see all of these guys waving their banners. Woo! Go, go, go! Yay, yay, yay! I see, you know, there's probably, there's a few of them. I think probably some of the prophets they're the, they're, the, they're the kind of the different ones. You know, they probably got their faces all painted. And their shirts off, screaming and hollering. Go, go, go. You know? I mean, I mean I, it, it's football season, right? It starts today. You know, right? And so, so I see this great cloud of witnesses that's cheering us on and saying, you can do this. I know. I know Harvey's big. God's bigger. Irma's huge, but God is huger. If that's a word, I don't know if that's a word. In Texas, that's a word. I, I know, I know what you're going through. I know what you're, I know what you're facing, but you serve a mighty God. And in the middle of all this, I don't want you to lose sight of the fact I believe, I believe, I believe that if we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses that's cheering us on, I think there's one in the crowd that's louder than them all. I think there's one in the crowd that's got season tickets front row. I think, he's the, I think he's the wildest and the loudest. Why? Because you're his child. You're his. And he's screaming and he's hollering, you can do this. I know you failed. I know you fell flat on your face. Get up, dust yourself off. You can do this. I know you did it again. It's okay. It's okay. Get up. I believe in you. I know what's in you. You have the spirit of the overcomer in you. Get up. I know, I know you're scratching your head and you're confused. I know, I know that you don't understand what's going on, but I'm telling you, you can get through this. They see he's screaming it from the rafters. This is listen. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, there was a um, we we had this orphan kid. Some of you have heard this story. We had this orphan kid that we supported up in Fairfield at an orphanage. And, and my father, I, I think we were going to Dallas and he dropped off us um, with my grandparents or something. And, and we had gone by to see this, this, this boy who was fatherless, motherless. And, and um, he had a track meet that day. And um, my dad was like, well, when do, you, when, when do you race? And so he told him the time the, the, of the track meet. And my dad says, well, I'm going to drop off my family and then I got to come back. So I'm a, I'll come watch you. And so, um, so the kid told my dad, I'm not very good. He was a long-distance runner. He said, I'm not very good. And my dad was like, that's okay. 
I'm, I'll come and watch you. And so my dad said that, we talked to my dad on the phone. He's, he, he told us the story. He said that he got there and the kid takes off in the race. And it's a long distance race. And the kid just took off running real fast. And my dad was like, man, he's really fast, but he's going to run out of gas. But he didn't run out of gas. This kid, who wasn't very good, he won. He won the race. I don't think it's because he, took, he, he, he drank a Red Bull before the race. And they didn't have those back then. He had a father in the crowd. He had somebody. He had somebody that came to cheer him on. He wasn't there to cheer anybody else on. He was there to cheer him on. When I was a kid. I was playing soccer, and I wasn't the best. I wasn't the best athlete in the world. That's probably why I'm preaching instead of <laughs> making millions uh-huh. uh, as an athlete. And there was this kid, Kelly Tischendorf. Uh, Kelly, I don't know if you'll watch this, but um, and he was good. Tischendorfs were good. Both, both, both boys were so good. And this kid come by me. I was a playing defenseman. And he came by me and whoo, went right by me. He did it like six times. And they just passed the ball to Kelly Tischendorf. And this kid, this kid, I probably remember his name because of wounds. I don't know. But anyway, he, got, he, he went by me. Like, I'm not telling you, like six times. And my dad was on the sidelines. And every time he goes, here he comes, here he comes. You can stop him. You can stop him. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. (laughs) Every time. My dad was so loud, too. Here he comes. Here he comes again. You got him. You got him. That's okay. You you get him next time. (laughs) And then one time. Kelly got the ball, and here he comes. And I did just, I wish we'd had a video of it. A sliding tackle, all ball. Kelly goes flying. I stopped the ball. I didn't really know what to do at that point. (laughs) That was new. I actually stopped the ball. All I know is after the game, you know what my dad talked about? Not the failures. He didn't talk about the failures. That didn't matter. What mattered was the one time I stopped the kid. The one time the kid went flying and his son did did good. It's the same thing with our Heavenly Father. So many of us are living in the past and the Father's saying, "Yeah, I, I don't really care about that. I redeem that. Listen, I'm concerned about, I'm concerned about right now. I'm concerned about the fact that you, you're, my, you're my son. And I don't care what the world says. I don't care what anybody else says. In fact, let them say something, right? You've been there, right? You've been there when somebody says something about their kid in the stands. Oh, that, you're going to say something about my kid? Listen, that's what, don't you mess. That's why it says don't mess with God's anointed. Who's his anointed? His kids? Don't mess with his kids. God takes care of that mess. Why? Because you're his son. You're his daughter. And he, he, is, he is cheering you on. He is the wild man in the crowd that's screaming at the top of his lungs. You can do this. You are made for this moment, this time right now. And I don't care how many times you failed. I don't care how many times you're going to fail. I'm still going to be cheering for you. I'm going to be rooting for you. Why? Because I'm your father. You're my child. And it does not matter. I'm not concerned about, I'm not concerned about your works. I'm not concerned about your, what you do and what you don't do. What I'm concerned about is that you're my child. I long to have have relationship with you. And if you'll just have a relationship with me, we'll walk through this thing and you'll overcome the things you need to overcome. You'll get through the things you need to get through and, and, and you'll live the kind of life that you were designed to live because that's, that's how good God is. He's our father. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads this morning. I want you to picture if you're watching football and you're listening to people scream and holler, 
or you're watching those goofballs in the stands, I want you to remember this. I want you to remember that God is your biggest fan. He's not the detached father. He's not the absentee father. I've coached kids for years and years and years. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when, when daddy's not there. Ever. When they do something good. Trust me, they all look for somebody to make eye contact. Did you see that? Did you, did you, did you see what it did? Our Heavenly Father is always in the stands. Whether we fail or whether we succeed, we've captured His eye. He's with you in the good times. He's with you in the bad times. When the floodwaters come, when the winds rage, He's with you. When you failed and when you succeed, He's with you. When your world seems to be falling apart, he's with you. And when you're at the pinnacle of success, he's with you. He's a good father. That song, at the beginning of that song, he's a good father. It says, I've heard thousands of stories of what they say that you're like. God doesn't want you to hear stories. He wants you to know what he's like. And it only comes through relationship with him. Maybe you're in this place today, and it looks like most of you are home, folks, but if you've never accepted his invitation to be a child, just raise your hand. I want to pray with you today. Is there anybody? Just, just I'm going to give it just a few seconds here. And say, yeah, I, I've never accepted that invitation to be a child of God. I, I want to do that today. Anybody? Okay. So right where you're at, just ask the Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me today? What about the Father and my, my position as a child? What do you want to say to me today? Just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. you stand to your feet this morning. I'm going to ask those that are the prayer team that's here, if you just come and just be available. Um, just everyone stand to your feet. And Corey's going to lead us in that course. As he does, I'm just going to invite you, if you have a need this morning, just to step out. They're going to be here to pray with you, whatever that need is. They're going to believe God with you concerning that need. And um, I'm excited about the next few weeks as we dig into this um, this identity thing about who we are and who God is. It's going to be powerful. And um, I'm excited about it. Go ahead, Corey, lead us in that, and Brent's going to come.